Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Monster of the Week. Today's monster is a truly awesome creature in the purest sense of the word. The Stellar Dragon is among the most powerful entities in the world of Spelljammer and one of the craziest creatures ever put into print in any D&D setting altogether. And today we are going to talk about just exactly what this thing is, of course how it fights, and many, many different ways in which you can use it in your D&D game. And while converting monsters from Spelljammer isn't always easy, there is a of course, a link in the description below to a 5th edition stat block for the Stellar Dragon in all of its different age categories. Now, tackling a fantastic being like the Stellar Dragon is no easy task for any lore master, so here to help me today is my friend and fellow D&D monster aficionado from the Mighty Glue Stick channel, AJ Pickett. Now we'll be back in a little bit to talk about some of the terrifying combat capabilities of this creature, but to get us started on just where the Stellar Dragon comes from, I'm going to hand you over to AJ. There's certainly more than enough room in the realm we're venturing into today to fit the best efforts of every D&D channel on the internet. Hello everyone, I'm happy to be here today to talk about such an incredible creature. Where shall we begin? I suppose first we should talk about where the Stellar Dragons live. The vast majority of the Prime Material Plane is a swirling cloud of rainbow-coloured chaotic semi-liquid ether that many call the Phlogiston, the Flow or the Rainbow Ocean, within which are countless crystal spheres of enormous size, which are nonetheless utterly dwarfed by the limitless space and the endless currents of the weird, multi-hued, opaque and highly flammable fluid they drift through, out of sight of most of the time, until one is close enough to see one of the stupendous spheres up close through the parting mists. This native environment of the Prime Material Plane is inhabited by an unknown variety and quantity of usually bizarre living creatures that the intelligent species who have ventured beyond the crystal spheres have only begun to study. We are largely familiar with the way things work on a planet inside a crystal sphere, but life out in the vast rainbow flow has its own rules, its own laws of physics, and the Stellar Dragon, being native to this realm, is perfectly adapted to them. As mentioned, the phlogiston gas is highly flammable, you, so usually or, uh, using or creating flames in this environment is generally a very bad idea. The merest spark or fire, magical or otherwise, when it touches the phlogiston causes an immediate explosion that violently ignites the spelljamming vessel, its occupants and the nearby surrounding area. Certain spells simply don't work in the phlogiston. For example, the power of the gods doesn't extend beyond the crystal spheres and the outer planes that they inhabit. So divine magic is off limits for the most part. Also, the phlogiston completely blocks access to the outer planes of existence. It's impossible to access another plane within the flow. Even the extra dimensional space created by Morden Kanan's magnificent mansion spell or a magical item such as a portable hole will fail to function unless much more powerful magic such as a wish spell are used to create the same minor effects. A possible exception is the border ethereal plane, but even so, it might prove off limits to all but the actual spirits of the departed. Stellar dragons fly and hover within the phlogiston. They are not harmed by it, they seem not to need to breathe or eat as other creatures do. They do have an entirely unique form of metabolism which is based mostly on mental energy. Now I think it's, I really need to express on you just what order of magnitude the Stellar Dragons are, because they're like nothing the player character has ever seen before, and discussing what little is known about their ecology, like all dragons, they're somewhat territorial, except in the limitless space of the phlogiston, it's not about the distance between each other, but rather about their ownership of the most interesting spheres, natural wonders within the phlogiston and ancient artifacts found within the flows that are very little understood by non-native creatures. So they're interested in knowledge. The Stellar Dragon's range covers the entire cosmos, so their exact numbers are unknown. In the vicinity of all known spheres, they have been observed coming together once every 500 years to convene in a grand ceremony where they take stock of their civilization, acknowledge their deeds, share information, and displays their full splendor and power. In doing so, they win the favor of the most mighty among them, which could be called the Tribal Head, also called the Mikado. The most ancient, powerful, and largest stellar dragon known. Although, when they get to such an age, they are so large it's hard to actually compare them to each other. The Mikado is a very striking presence. 
uh, a single pure crystal horn grows from its forehead large enough to take make the uh, biggest spell jamming vessel look like a toy gleaming with stunning refractions and inner radiance the Mikado chooses the most worthy stellar dragons that they come uh, when and they come together during the ceremony to mate. When they part, each mate produces a single offspring, born fully sentient and able to fend for itself. The offspring is celebrated and then move off, making on their own way in the cosmos, traveling where they please and afforded safe passage from the tribe to explore as they become fascinated with new territory or the inevitable jostling and negotiations and haggling begins among the adults as and they obtain this um, dynamic spheres to watch over as uh, on their own so their their territory and their politics and stuff is mainly like um, it's it's about what's of interest to the cosmos and they have a sort of a pecking order on the best spots to to watch the show essentially the spheres that contain civilization which are very interesting to monitor is the actual food stuff of the stellar dragons they subsist on thought not just within the confines of the phlogiston and the bright jewels of the crystal spheres but also adjacent dimensions the parallel realities of the feywild and the shadow felt the upper planes beyond the veil of the astral where the thoughts and dreams of mortal life forms flow in the endless vital stream enriching and creating new vistas in the planes above the dimensions of higher thought and belief and the lower dimensions of primal drive and evil they drink from this river and study mortal life but even more so they crave the conversation and insight of the custodians of the spheres the gods themselves stellar dragons ultimate goal is truth it abhors they abs they abhor dishonesty and misinformation through its information may be cryptic it's never false when they tell you something and they have forgotten more about the history of the multiverse than any mortal will ever know stellar dragons digest truth and manifest it in a physical form with gems and pearls emerging randomly on their body which is how they get their their name they look like constellations of bright shining gems the number of gems and pearls studying its scales mark its status amongst the other dragons the encrustation is roughly an indicator of its age younger dragons have few gems whereas venerable stellar dragons are covered in jewels the scales of stellar dragons are an iridescent deep purple with chrome drips at the end and tip of each scale up close the pigment and texture of their scales is a complex pattern of mineral crystals gems of myriad colors and sizes adorn the scales in random patterns giving the stellar dragon its spectacular uh, beauty two main fins like the sails of a lionfish adorn either side of its central torso and four enormous lace-like wings provide guidance and stability within the rainbow ether so they basically look kind of like long serpents with uh, the spectacular trailing fins of like a goldfish numerous other fins of various sizes cover the rest of the dragon's body there's no visible arms or legs they just have no need for them in the astral the scale of the body is simply astounding even when they are first born they measure 30 feet or nine meters long and that's as just brand new they quickly grow in size nourished from the strange metabolism inside them it's pretty incredible that the birth of these creatures includes the creation of a miniature black hole within them in dungeons and dragons this has uh, different effects and a different name we call it a sphere of annihilation as they grow in age they grow into their incredible size a juvenile stellar dragon is 1200 feet or 366 meters long an adult is 4200 feet or 1280 meters long a great worm at the bare minimum is 21,000 feet or 6,400 meters long and the Mikado the chieftain is much much larger with a body length measuring 568 miles or 914 kilometers long stellar dragons are contemplative and peaceful by nature they have a fairly neutral outlook on the affairs of the mortal beings within the multiverse they consider stooping to meddle in the affairs of smaller beings to be loutish and in bad taste when they encounter humanoids stellar dragons prefer to watch them rather than involve themselves they're essentially feeding on the knowledge that they may glean only rarely do they speak with lesser beings they don't really need to they're fully telepathic however if one has 
previously unknown information for the dragon, they may gain its interest and even gain useful knowledge and trade. Information is the stellar dragon's food and drink, if anything could be called such, and it is willing to trade in kind. One rumour has it that the Greyhawk wizard Bigby learned his interposing hand and grasping hand spells from the Stellar Dragon in exchange for a juicy tidbit of information, which makes a lot of sense when you think about the fact that they don't have hands, so how do they manipulate things? I'll be back with you soon to talk to you more about using these epic creatures in your game. Just uh, let me hand it over to Dungeon Dad again and he can talk to you about the game mechanics and the tactical considerations, physical and magical and special features in more detail. Thank you for that lovely summary of these magnificent beings, AJ, and I think it's important to understand just what these dragons are capable of in terms of abilities and combat potential before we move on to some plot hooks and idea building. The short version of this is to say that if you ever find yourself in a position where an adult stellar dragon is your adversary, you've already lost. They have most of the typical traits you'd expect from a dragon, massive bodies covered in armor-like scales, a powerful bite, and of course a devastating breath weapon, all of which only get more and more deadly as the dragon matures in age. Interestingly enough, the one feature these dragons actually lack, which most other dragons have, is a pair of claws. Just because of the way their bodies are shaped and the way they've adapted to navigate between their interstellar homes, it's left them with more aerodynamic bodies that don't actually have appendages. So instead of the claw attacks, which most dragons usually have, stellar dragons are more likely to try to slam their opponents with their massive tails. And when it comes to their breath weapon, as AJ said, they come from a place where any amount of fire or even the smallest bit of energy with potential to ignite a flame can be extremely dangerous. So, how did the Stellar Dragons adapt? Well, they still have a cone as their breath weapon, but rather than expelling any type of energy like pretty much every other dragon, they instead manipulate gravity in that cone to pull creatures towards them. And this is of course because within the maw of every stellar dragon is a black hole, or in D&D terms, a sphere of annihilation. By pulling creatures into their jaws, they're exposing them to this black sphere that destroys anything it touches. This means that even the smaller stellar dragons are at best going to cost you a big chunk of hit points in force damage, and at worst, potentially just outright kill you. Once the Stellar Dragon reaches a large enough size to easily fit massive creatures in its mouth though, the chance of survival drops to almost zero if you fail your initial dexterity save to avoid being pulled in by the dragon's gravitic breath. The other unique trick that the Stellar Dragon has up its scaled sleeves, or lack thereof, is a total mastery of magic. A Stellar Dragon possesses such an intense level of control over the arcane that they can cast tons of spells to aid them both in and out of combat. One of their favorite tricks is to summon creatures from other planes to fight on their behalf. As newborn wormlings, they are fairly limited in terms of what they can summon, but by the time they reach adulthood, they are capable of summoning powerful allies from all across the multiverse. Angels, devils, great elementals, powerful fey, you name it. Once they reach full-on adulthood, they're even able to cast Wish a limited number of times per day, which gives you access to pretty much any spell you could possibly want to cast. Any creature that always has the perfect tool for whatever situation it could find itself in is definitely a creature to be feared. Now in 5th edition, all true dragons have four age categories. They go from wormlings, to young dragons, to adult dragons, to full-on ancient dragons. However, in the case of the stellar dragon, I felt the need to add in an extra age category, and that is the Great Stellar Worm. This age category is meant to be a true representation of what a Stellar Dragon's adult form actually looks like when you convert it the way it's written in Spelljammer. This is not a creature I ever recommend putting your players up against because it is the D&D equivalent of all-out nuclear war, but if you are running a crazy high-level epic game using some third-party supplements and your party is kitted out with tons of magic items, maybe 
this will be just the thing you need. But this monster is essentially on the same power level as most gods, if not even more powerful than some of them. Clocking in at CR 33 puts it well above most things in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. There might be one or two other creatures that actually have stats above that number. Turns out being able to cast Wish an infinite number of times per day as a legendary action is pretty good. That said though, if you do want to use a Stellar Dragon in battle, it is totally possible, even for a mid-level party, you simply just want to use one of the dragon's first two age categories. You know, the ones where it's actually feasible to run them as a monster encounter and they're not going to just completely annihilate everything in their path. I also find the fact that these creatures are so vulnerable during the beginning of their life has a lot of story potential and allows us to use this creature for some awesome encounters. Truly in combat they can be deadly adversaries during their younger years, but once they reach full maturity you're contending with something feared by the divine. Thankfully though they are neutral creatures who simply seek to understand the multiverse rather than destroy it. And this, I guess, brings us on to our next topic, which is just exactly how can we use something as fantastic as a Stellar Dragon in our D&D 5th Edition game? Well, AJ is back to start us off with some ideas on how we could answer that question, so take it away. Misinformation causes Stellar Dragon severe powerful, painful indigestion, and as with its smaller kin, a dragon in pain is a dangerous being indeed. So they abhor dishonest beings and tend to not want to be around people who can spread false information or lies. Lies cause them pain. Gems of wisdom and pearls of knowledge that manifest on them are valuable almost beyond calculation. The information they contain can be liberated and used to gain enormous profit, both arcane knowledge and historical information. Sages and wizards would do nearly anything to gain one. The Stellar Dragon understands the underpinnings of the multiverse. These primeval watchers have seen the rise and fall of many civilization. Such is the powers of, of this knowledge that according to some texts, the power of artifacts themselves and relics come from the gems that encrust Stellar Dragons. This crystallized everlasting knowledge of thousands of beings, say these legends, provides the power that runs these wonderful objects, essentially a psychic crystal of perfect clarity. As the gems encrusting the scales are the measure of worth and status within their own society, it would require an extraordinary cause to persuade a stellar dragon to give up one of its gems or pearls willingly. They have done so in the past, but it's an extremely rare occurrence. The best bet is to try and recover a dragon scale that has been torn loose from the dragon from some other event, such as a collision with a massive but obscured object within the rainbow ocean or from their body, as we shall discuss later. The crystal horn of the Mikado is the only known material that can restore the Rod of Law. See the Rod of Seven Parts of Adventure or a video of mine on that particular uh, adventure path. The, uh, within each mature stellar dragon is a perfect diamond of concordance, which is vital to their metabolism of knowledge and truth. It also provides them with uh, some of their flight ability. If enough are extracted, a process which is fatal to the dragon, they can be crafted into a cage of concordance, an artifact capable of safely containing the shard of ultimate evil that was responsible for the spread of the abyss. If both the Shard and the Ruby Rod of Asmodeus are placed inside the Cage of Concordance, the layers of the Abyss will not only splinter apart as the planet boundaries snap back into place, but further demonic corruption of any planes that contain divine beings will be impossible, effectively halting the growth of the Abyss forever. Stellar dragons that are over 4,000 years old have such mastery of magic that they are capable of working together to perform the ritual of creating a new crystal sphere. They can also create a portal through a crystal sphere at will and create minor crystal sphere vessels that can travel nearly anywhere within the multiverse except the far realm or the positive and negative energy planes. Stellar dragons attract colonies of flumps who happily dwell within the body of the adults or in flying crystal formations within the phlogiston that follow along after a dragon or move ahead scouting out crystal spheres where there's more intense mental energy for the stellar dragons to feed on essentially acting as probiotics and pilot fish for the stellar dragons. Mature stellar dragons are able to manifest a herald in the form of a shard mind when it wishes to send a representative within the crystal sphere to communicate with specific mortal creatures face to face 
down at their scale. The shard mind has a personality of its own and can also operate as a remote unit for the dragon's mind and when that transition takes place you'll know about it. Stellar dragons can also summon creatures from other planes of existence though it is unknown how they manage to do this within the rainbow ocean itself which normally prohibits any plan of travel at all but as we know the stellar dragons are capable of manifesting wishes and other very very powerful magics well beyond the, bound, bond, the boundaries of Mistra's control over high level magic. Thank you AJ for those brilliant plot hooks and since we're here we might as well throw a few more your way. Given that the stellar dragon can be vulnerable when it's in its youngest phase, perhaps the party encounters some type of lost dragon wormling that has made its way to the material plane and doesn't really know how to get back home. Perhaps it's trying to find a portal to get to one of the other planes of existence or merely a way to get back to its divine celestial realm. Perhaps the dragon's even wounded and that's why it's not fully able to defend itself so the party is given a choice where they can essentially escort this creature back to safety and if they're willing to go out of their way to do a good deed for this dragon maybe they will be rewarded with some type of custom spells or some unique magic items that only the dragon is able to create or they could always go hunting for this dragon at the behest of some corrupt evil draconic connoisseur who wants a very unique specimen for his collection. Another problem that the stellar dragon could encounter at times is that maybe it needs to get access to a certain location to find a certain bit of lore or some ancient tome that holds untold secrets within it, but that bit of knowledge is hidden deep within a temple that is buried underground and is built for humanoid sized creatures. And unfortunately that means that an ancient dragon with a body that is literally hundreds of miles long is not going to be able to get access to that place. Now that dragon could create a shard mind or some other type of being meant to act as an avatar of itself and send it to go collect this bit of knowledge, but of course when it does so that being is most likely going to be stripped of many of the dragon's powers. So maybe the dragon's avatar seeks out an adventuring party to help it go and delve into this ancient temple and secure this bit of knowledge. Now of course the dragon's also not going to leave out the fact that this tome is said to be buried with a king's ransom in gold and other powerful magic items, but all it's interested in is the bit of lore, so that all belongs to your party if they're willing to help the dragon excavate this ancient temple. Maybe you've even got two different stellar dragons that have both caught wind of this same lost secret and they're kind of in a friendly competition where your party, which is aligned with one of these avatars, is racing against another party that has aligned itself with a different dragon's avatar, both of which are trying to get to the center of this temple before the other. Or if you want to put a little bit of a spin on the classic party seeking a genie plotline to have some type of wish granted, maybe the party is seeking a stellar dragon to have some type of wish granted. I mean, you could literally run an entire campaign where everyone in your party has some type of scrap of knowledge that they think is known only to them, and if they're able to bring that and present that knowledge to a stellar dragon, then they will have some type of wish granted for them before the dragon departs. I could picture a campaign where the only character creation stipulation is that everyone has to pick the hermit background, so you all have that one bit of crazy lore that like almost no one else knows about, and then bringing that knowledge to the dragon is just the whole campaign, that's your quest. And of course, peril abounds along the way, and there's someone seeking whatever secret is the party knows, or multiple secrets they might know. Could be a really fun game, and I mean, you're basically just ripping off Dragon Ball Z, and that's almost guaranteed to always be a good time. Or maybe the stellar dragon involved in your game has already been killed by some great evil. This force of evil has stolen the young dragon's diamond heart and is using its power to enact its will upon the realm. So of course your party must come in and stop this evil force, but then what happens after the fact when a much older stellar dragon appears to check in on its deceased kin who it hasn't heard from in a while? Stellar dragons are simply magnificent in many different ways and like all dragons they have tons of different potential for how you want to apply them and use them whether as friends, foes, random encounters, big bad evil guys or anything in between really. So if you want to give your players a draconic counter they will never forget then maybe the Stellar Dragon is the right fit for your game. I also want to give a huge shout out today as well to AJ for helping me unpack this massive creature. And I do mean massive both literally and in terms of how much information about the Stellar Dragon there was out there. It was a lot of work to put together, definitely a labor of love, but I know I loved every second of it. My pleasure. Hopefully more of the D&D sages can get together and do more crossovers, sharing our love of the hobby. I'm calling out uh, Mr. Rex and Jordan looking at you guys after all it's all about getting together and telling more stories about uh dnd with your friends right 
I just wanted to add a final bit about what could possibly serve as the lair for creatures that can be several miles long. Well, there's at least one example in the literature of a broken crystal sphere flooded with the rainbow ether, the planets it once contained still floating around among the rubble orbiting around in the drifting chaos that still have, have atmospheres as would big shards of the crystal sphere which are probably as large as continental failure in itself crystal spheres are so massive they could uh, be the setting for an entire campaign really with the stellar dragon being more like a self-contained ecosystem within the region supporting a whole slew of exotic species that subsist on mental power rather than food air and water such as the flumps the modrons crystal entities elementals uh, ethereal creatures, astral projections of gold dragons, living spells, constructs, and so on. I had the idea of a stellar dragon simply gesturing to a pile of spelljammer spare parts with some new combination of mending and awaken spells, and it just sort of assembles itself magically into a brand new warforged loaded with navigational data and a penchant for adventure and a zany personality. I mean, there could be Spelljammer fantasy versions of Warforged Cybertron out there somewhere in the endless rainbow ocean, and the Stellar Dragons have been places and seen things that most mortals would not even believe. I could, I could quite handle a Spelljammer uh, Transformers crossover. Adult Stellar Dragons are not only capable of taking on an adventuring party, for sure, they're also a threat to a Spelljamming vessel. And the really, really big stellar dragons are not just massive living things, they're also adventure locations. For example, imagine the race to mine the gems and pearls from a dead stellar dragon. Do the other dragons have some sort of ceremony to dispose of the body? Is there some sort of stellar dragon burial ground? Could there be species like Grix, Grells, Flumps and Beholders who lived inside the really old stellar dragon who have no idea that the universe outside their miles long home is the Phlogis and Sea and Crystal Spheres and things like that. Unless they, of course they were in communication with the intelligence of the entity that they were living in and considered to be some sort of a god. There are endless possibilities in the vast reaches of the phlogiston. Thanks for having me, everyone. I'll see you later. Until the next one, AJ, it was a pleasure working with you. And if you do like this creature and you want to use it in your game, definitely take a look in the description below. As I mentioned, the stat block is all there for all the different age categories in terms of a Google document. And of course, if you are already one of my awesome patrons, you'll already know this, but there is a monster manual style stat block available on the Patreon page. And normally this is a patron exclusive perk, but just since this is kind of a special episode, that monster stat block will still be on the Patreon page, but it's gonna be open for everyone. So feel free to take a look and download that at your leisure. And if you do like what I do here and you want to support the channel, please consider subscribing for more monsterific D&D content. And also be sure to check out the companion video to this one, which is over on AJ's channel, which is a whole deep dive into the giant space hamster lore. Another awesome creature from Spelljammer. While much less epic and grandiose when compared to the Stellar Dragon, it is much fluffier and cuter and a lot more fun. <laughs> And as always, if you have a recommendation for monsters you'd like to see featured on this channel and Monster of the Week, please leave a comment below or get at me on Discord or tweet at me on Twitter, whatever your preferred method of communication is. Let me know what your favorite cool obscure monster is and I will absolutely add it to the list. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it and I will see you in the next video. Until then.